the sanctuary have ever heard of these two men, Bezalel and Aholiab. Raise your hand if you have. All right, not very many of us. I saw a few, but don't worry. There's no reason to expect that any of us would know these characters who are mentioned only twice in the entirety of the Bible, both times in passing regarding the construction of the tabernacle. Even after reading the entirety of the Bible, we probably wouldn't remember their names. They are obscure characters and an often skimmed through part of the Old Testament. As we mentioned during the children's message, we just finished our sermon series, Retold Sunday School Stories You Thought You Knew, where we were taking a deeper look at some of the most famous stories that would be in our children's Bible. Stories like Noah's Ark, or Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, or Jonah and the Whale. But there are not many Sunday school classes on the adventures of Bezalel and Aholiab and the construction of the tabernacle and all its utensils and the altar with its incense and the basin with its stand. There's nothing thrilling or sexy about their story. I bet more of us have probably heard of the character of Deborah. Now, she's only mentioned in two chapters of the Bible as well, but she fights against the enemies of Israel and saves the day. We probably are more likely to have heard of Goliath. He's only in one chapter, and yet his story shows the power of God to overcome all odds. Zacchaeus, the good Samaritan, the Roman centurion at the foot of Jesus' cross who says, surely this is the Son of God. All just passing references, yet we know about their stories. Not so the story of these two men with hard-to-pronounce names who take part in an art project. But then again, we probably haven't heard of Charles Lutz. Charles Lutz was a Swiss diplomat working in Hungary during the 1930s and 1940s during the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. Charles Lutz negotiated between the Nazi party and the Hungarian government for 8,000 visas for European Jews to immigrate out of Europe. He then established Swiss annexes across the country of Hungary where European Jewry could go and live for in safety without the influence of European governments. During the course of his career, often in direct disobedience to his government, Charles Lutz saved the lives of more than 60,000 Jews during the Holocaust. I'm sure that we have probably also not heard of Niels Bolin, even though his work impacts us on a daily basis. In 1958, Niels invented the three-point seat belt that is used in cars, even though when he first came up with the invention, there was a lot of pushback, especially when seat belts became mandatory, as we'll see in this video here from the early 80s. Former Highway Patrol Lieutenant Chris Miller hears it all when it comes to seat belts. I hear it's uncomfortable. Uh, it wrinkles my clothes. It is the new seatbelt ordinance. If the town south will get this way, seatbelts will be mandatory for everybody riding in the front seat of a car through a witch lift. That's a detour the town to get to Kalamazoo. They pass a seatbelt. Oh, I just I don't use a seatbelt. I wouldn't wear my seatbelt. If I get caught, I get caught, I guess. I oppose it on the basis that it replaces the free will of the individual with the desires of the state. The question here is whether we have the right, whether we have the responsibility, whether we have the judgment to turn to the citizens of the state and be there in 1984, big brother. Big brother and its seatbelt laws. But Mr. Bolin's work has saved, according to estimates, millions of lives. I'm guessing we've also never heard of Claudette Colvin, who at the age of 15 was arrested for deliberately refusing to give up her seat to a white woman on a crowded, segregated bus nine months before Rosa Parks' famous act of resistance. Claudette's lawsuit actually made its way all the way to the Supreme Court and was the basis for the ruling to desegregate Montgomery's buses. I'm even more likely to bet that unless you've heard me tell her story, you also haven't heard of Elizabeth Porter. 
Elizabeth Porter is the woman who showed up to work every day at social services and would go to my mother and tell her a Bible story. My mother did her best to avoid Elizabeth Porter whenever she could, but she always found her way to my mother until one day she didn't come and tell her a Bible story. My mother marched into her office and demanded to know, why didn't you tell me a story today? And Elizabeth Porter said, I thought you didn't like them. And my mother said, well, I don't. <laughs> and then she became a Christian that day at the age of 26. And she took those stories and passed them down to me and my siblings. And now here I am before you as a preacher, all because of this obscure woman whose story I love to tell. So today, we turn from our popular Sunday school stories to a new sermon series on the opposite side of the spectrum of familiarity entitled Hidden Figures. We will read through stories of people who are often overlooked and forgotten in the midst of 31,102 verses within Scripture. And in Exodus 31, we meet Bezalel and Aholiab. And just as God worked through the lives of Charles Lutz and Claudette Colvin and Elizabeth Porter, God works through the lives of these two men in their roles as craftsmen. And so as we listen to their story today, may we hear ourselves that we too have been called for the work that God has given to us. Exodus 31 opens by saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel. The God who created the heavens and the earth, the majesty that we see all around us, has also called us forth and calls us by whatever name we call ourselves. And God is calling us by that name. God knows that we are Bezalel, the child of Uri, the child of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. God knows our past our family baggage, our mistakes, our fears, and God wants us to come as we are with everything that we are because God knows everything about us and calls us by name for the work that God has appointed for us. God knows our broken relationships, our perceived inadequacies, our idiosyncrasies, and none of that matters or prevents God from calling us. God is calling us by name. Trisha, Tim, Faith, I have work for you to do. The passage continues. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with wisdom, with understanding and knowledge. Bezalel, a man with no credentials, degrees, prestige, riches, or power, is the first individual after the Garden of Eden that the Bible declares was filled with the Spirit of God. I love that fact so much. Leading up to Exodus chapter 31, neither Abraham or Sarah or Isaac or Rebekah or Jacob or Joseph or even Moses are we told they were filled with the Spirit of God. But Bezalel is filled with the Spirit of God. God has a tendency within Scripture to use the people that the rest of the world views as weak or unqualified or not up to the task, not enough experience, the kinds of people who go for interview after interview and yet can never land a job. When God sends the prophet Samuel to anoint a new king over the people of Israel from among the sons of Jesse, Samuel thinks for sure that it is the eldest son standing before him, the handsome, strong, tall, intelligent specimen of a man. And yet it is David who his father had left in the fields, thinking him unworthy of coming before Samuel, who is chosen for the throne. There are so many reasons that people give for thinking that God could not possibly have called them. I'm not smart enough. I've never read the Bible. I don't have any money. No one will listen to me. I'm not good at anything. I'm too young. I'm too old. I don't work outside the home. I don't even know if I believe in God. I'm not spiritual enough. I don't have anything to contribute. My work isn't important. God doesn't care what I do. I have no idea how to help. 
But no matter what our fear might be, God also fills all of us with God's Spirit so that we can do the work to which we have been called. The passage continues by telling us that Bezalel has been filled with the Spirit of God to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. The first person filled with the Spirit of God is not called to preach a revival. He's not called to lead the Israelites out of captivity. He's not called to take an army into battle or sit on a throne. He's called to be an artist. Pastor Jen and I hear from so many people who come to talk to us who are having trouble finding fulfillment in their work. They often lament that their jobs don't have enough of an impact on the world or make a difference in people's lives. But the reality is that no matter what work we find ourselves doing, whether it is what pays us or what we volunteer for, God can work through us in any context, in any place, any vocation, any job, any hobby, any day. It doesn't have to be ministry. It doesn't have to be wide-reaching. It doesn't have to be life-changing. It doesn't have to be something other than caring for a child. It doesn't have to go viral on TikTok. God can call us to anything. A shout out to all of the artists in the room today, a category of people that does not include me. How cool is it to have a passage that specifically says God calls someone and fills them with the Spirit of God so that they can work with metal and stones and wood. This church is a testament to the power of artistry for drawing us closer to God from the stained glass windows to the mosaics above our chapel or on our accessibility uh, ramp or right here on our chancel, or the wooden doors that are carved on the entrance to the sanctuary or here on the pulpit and the lectern, or even our choir and our handbells and our guest musicians. Did you know that even our air vents up here have the names of the gospel writers? It's covered over there, but you can see Mark and Matthew. How's that for hidden figures? I can guarantee that you can bring the love of God into every job or activity represented in this room. Whether it is as a student or parent or PTA president or video gamer or office worker or event coordinator or salesperson or police officer or protester or activist or lawyer or DoorDash driver or coach or crocheter or dinner host or fundraiser or veterinarian or walking buddy or church volunteer or even just as someone's friend, the list is endless and I know that everything we do is on that that list. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture comes from the book of Ecclesiastes. The author is trying to figure out what the purpose of life is. Is it earning a lot of money? Is it having power over other people? Is it acquiring a lot of lovers? And the author says the point of life is just to love God and enjoy whatever work we do in this world to love God and enjoy whatever work we do in this world. We can't forget about Aholiab, though. After learning about Bezalel's calling, we are told in verse 6, Moreover, I have appointed Aholiab, child of Ahisamech of the tribe of Dan, to help him. What an interesting calling. Aholiab, your calling in life is to help this guy over here. But so much of the work that is done in this world, so much of the work that we all do, is done behind the scenes. Perhaps people will never know what it is we do. We may not have our names written down in the history books. We might not get our own Wikipedia page. We might be helping another person or institution or business. But it's okay to be called to help. I come from a family of six other siblings, and one of my younger brothers was called into ministry much earlier than I was. At the age of 12, this brother who is profoundly deaf began preaching at hearing churches all over the country. He then helped translate the Gospel of John into American Sign Language on videotape. I have a little clip of it here that we can watch.
He's 12 years old. How's that for making your older brother feel inadequate? Come on. When he was 14, he started a nonprofit organization that was leading international trips to other countries to do leadership training for deaf individuals. He then, at 16, started translating the Bible into Russian and Romanian sign language on videotape. And then when I was in seminary, this brother and my mother and I started a deaf church in the Kansas City area. And my role throughout all of this was to be their helper. I know it can be hard when you're not creating something that's from your own vision. It's not your own work. It's not the path that you wanted. But it doesn't make the work any less important. Moses is one of the central figures of the Old Testament, but it was his brother Aaron who went along to help Moses and speak for him in front of Pharaoh. Simon of Cyrene was called to help Jesus carry his cross, and I bet Jesus appreciated the help. The role of helper in this world is vital. The last five verses of our passage today detail the specific items that Bezalel and Aholiab are called to make. And here's what I want to know about this passage. The Israelites have just escaped from Egypt where they had been enslaved for 400 years. God promised to bring them to a land flowing with milk and honey. And then they stop in the middle of the desert for an entire year to make these products. At first glance, it seems as if Bezalel and Aholiab have no beneficial impact on anyone. And yet what they create over the course of this year will be the place where people go to encounter God. And perhaps that might be a good guiding principle for us no matter what it is that we do. Does the way we interact with others, does the way we conduct ourselves, does the way we help or the words we speak help people encounter God? Do people know that we will treat them with respect no matter who they are? Do people experience love and grace from us even in difficult situations? Do people know that we will stand up for others even when it's hard? Even if the only people we talk to during the day are the two other people assigned to our same project or the people who live in our house or are sit in our classroom or live in our retirement community, we will never know the impact we can have on others' lives by doing our best to reflect the unconditional love of God. And so it matters very little that we have never heard of Bezalel and Aholiab. Because in this passage, God has called these two people and God has equipped them to do their work and God finds value and favor in their work regardless of anyone hearing about them. And God has called each of us. We are capable. We are filled with the Spirit of God. We are valued and we can make a difference in anything that we do. Amen.